Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here. As we come to realize over the last year, many of Vermont's schools and childcare facilities are in older buildings, which means lead from piping and plumbing fixtures can get into the water. With this understanding, the health department piloted a lead testing project during the 2017 to 2018 school year. Keep in mind, uh, this was prior to the passage of Act 66, where we asked 16 schools to voluntarily allow the state to test for lead in their drinking water. Of this small sample, lead was detected at all participating schools, and about a third had at least one tap above the EPA's action level of 15 parts per billion. The state worked with the schools where elevated uh, levels were found to replace or permanently take out of service affected plumbing fixtures. The pilot project demonstrated the importance of going further in testing every tap. This ultimately led my administration and the legislature to agree on the need for statewide testing. The budget adjustment uh, funded this effort, and on June 17th, I signed the legislative proposal, Act 66, into law. It requires all public and independent schools and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and all licensed or registered child care facilities to test for lead at every tap uh, used for drinking or cooking. Health Commissioner Dr. Mark Levine, Agency of uh, Natural Resources, Secretary Julie Moore, and a team from the Department of Environmental Conservation are here to update you on where we are at this point. This work is a critical part of our responsibility to protect the health of Vermont's children, keeping them safe from exposure to lead in drinking water. At two places where they spend a lot of time, which is so important because science tells us the brain develops immensely fast for kids at a younger age. The statewide effort is a collaboration between the Health Department, the Agency of Education, the Department for Children and Families, the Department of Environmental Conservation, and the approximately 440 schools and more than 1,200 child care facilities where testing is being conducted. And it's well worth uh, the effort. We're working not only to protect the health of our children, but to promote their future successes as well. So I'll now uh, welcome Dr. Levine to provide an update on these efforts. Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Reducing the risk of lead poisoning children is a top public health priority here and around the nation. There's no safe level of lead in the human body at any age. Lead's a neurotoxin and children are, as the governor pointed out, at special risk because their bodies absorb lead more easily than adults. Exposure to lead can slow down a child's physical growth, but it also can cause developmental, learning, and behavioral problems. While the effects of lead poisoning are irreversible, lead poisoning itself is entirely preventable. In Vermont in 2018, 420 children under the age of six were poisoned by lead. The major source of lead poisoning is paint in older housing, but lead in plumbing, pipes, and fixtures can add to a child's overall lead exposure. So that's why this project is of such tremendous importance and worthy of the tremendous amount of work that's required in testing every tap in every school that is used for drinking water. And then, of course, remediating them when needed. And this is at more than 1,600 schools and child care locations. When lead is detected above the threshold, at or above four parts per billion in drinking water, by law now, the school or child care provider is required to stop using those taps for drinking and cooking and take corrective action to reduce the amount of lead in the water. In our experience thus far, the fixes are relatively inexpensive and very effective at reducing lead levels. We're thankful for the support and collaboration of the governor with the legislature in passing Act 66 and for the collaborative effort of multiple other state agencies. The Department of Children and Families, for one, has been very instrumental 
and contacting and providing technical assistance to all child care providers, and they will continue to be. More than 300 have already tested their TAPS, and you can see the results on the website that will be demonstrated for you shortly. The Agency of Education has helped direct communication with the schools. We were able to test five schools early before the close of the school year this year, and the rest are being scheduled now to begin testing when the school year begins and then continue throughout the following year. The Department of Environmental Conservation of the Agency of Natural Resources has the critical role of providing invaluable technical assistance with remediation actions and follow-up test results. And as you hear, uh, their staff from the Agency of Digital Services are responsible for the website you're going to be able to uh, view real time. And I want to also thank the dozens of experts we have at my own health department who've been working so hard to manage this very complex project. They've created the extensive public information and communication materials, instructional videos for the school staff and others, webinars and in-person trainings, guidance documents, and they continue to uh, review TAP inventories that schools are sending in to comply with us every day. They've also coordinated the logistics of getting test kits to and from the schools and the child care facilities, and they've analyzed uh, water samples and reported test results. This work is reflected on our health department's website at healthvermont.gov slash leadtest dash response. I'd like to now introduce Julie Moore, the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Good morning. Water is a critical resource to the state of Vermont, and we're committed to making sure all Vermonters have access to clean, safe drinking water. Staff from the Agency of Natural Resources and Department of Health, as you've heard, working in partnership with the Agency of Education and Department for Children and Families, schools, and child care centers statewide are working to sample and for lead and make sure that drinking water is protected. In Vermont, many of our buildings are older, which means the plumbing is also older and fixtures are more likely to have lead. As we've heard today, lead does not come from the water itself. Lead contamination happens when the water reacts with various pieces of plumbing, some of which may contain lead. Not many child care facilities or schools have lead service lines or lead pipes, but we know that there can be high lead content in things like older solder and brass. That's why the state of Vermont is making sure that every outlet that is used or expected to be used for drinking or cooking at our schools and child care facilities will be sampled. Actually, two samples are being collected at each outlet. A first draw sample, which is water that sat in the pipes for 8 to 18 hours, um, which is part of the reason, as Dr. Levine alluded to, that we need to do this work when schools are in service. We don't want that water to have sat indefinitely, but for a finite amount of time. And then a flush sample, um, where the tap is open, water is allowed to run for 30 seconds, and then a sample is collected. If um, The reason we do this is to investigate what the likely source of the lead is whether it's the fixture or some plumbing component deeper in the system. If lead is found above four parts per billion in the water at one of these facilities, that outlet is immediately taken out of service. Many of the solutions to high lead levels are easy and low cost. They include things like replacing plumbing fixtures, removing redundant or seldom used fixtures, and encouraging the use of centrally located, well-maintained bottle filling stations. Once a fix has been implemented, uh, the tap will be retested to ensure lead levels have been reduced. And for families and community members interested in tracking the test results, we've created a user-friendly website where this information can be viewed. Uh, the results are organized by facility, and on the website we'll also note the steps that the facility has taken to fix any outlets that tested above the four parts per billion threshold. The results are available online at leadresults.vermont.gov and posted as they become available. And Patrick Southern um, from the ANR ADS team will now demonstrate how parents, families, and community members can navigate this website. Thanks, Julie. I'll just briefly get set up first. Dial up the 
tricks. Okay, no one look at my password. <laughs> it's, it's not password. <laughs> With a zero. <laughs> Jack Thurston comes up. <laughs> See how fast your internet is here, huh? <laughs> All right, so I'm Patrick Southern. I'm with the Agency of Digital Services, and I primarily support the uh, drinking water folks in the Department of Environmental Conservation, building software and things like that. What we've done here with our various partner agencies involved in this project is we've set up, as Julie said, a user-friendly website that's available, publicly accessible, so anyone can go on and search for a school or child care and see the details of what the school has done in terms of testing, what results are available, and any action that they've taken if they had a result that exceeded the action level. So that website's available, as Julie said, at leadresults.vermont.gov. And if you go to that website, you'll see this search page when you first get there. This provides you a way to search by school or child care name, or a piece of it if you know it, by town, and you can specify if you want to see schools, child cares, or both. So for this example, let's just search everything and see. So you can see there's a bunch of schools and child cares that have tested and the results are posted on this website already. We'll choose the first one, Four Corners Children's Center. And when you do that, it will bring you to a page that will give you all the details of what this school has done. So at the top, you see some general information about Act 66 and how to interpret the results you're going to see. And then you'll first be presented with a TAP summary table. So this organizes the, all of the information by individual TAP. So you'll see one row for every TAP that was tested, and you'll see associated information like the most recent first draw sample, the most recent flush sample, when those samples were taken, and when they were analyzed. And for this first one, you can see it exceeded the action level of four parts per billion. So it's in bold, dark red. And as a result, this child care was required to take action to address that action level exceedance. And you can see the action they took was to replace that fixture. That was a permanent action. And they took that action on August 30th, 2019. The only other features of this public search website is if you are pulling this up on your phone right now, anyone, uh, you'll first be brought to a tap summary cards page. So this is just the same information you saw on that table, but in a mobile-friendly view, so you don't have a table going all across your phone. The other thing that's on here is all results. If you want to really dive into it, or if anyone wants to dive into it and see every sample that was taken, they can get that here and they can export this to Excel if they want to do further analysis. And then I'll just mention, you saw the fixture replacement action taken here. This came from the authorized users for this child care center. They put, that, they put that information in this remediation form that's available here, and it shows up on the website what they put. And there are frequently asked questions available. That's all I have. Thanks. So well, we can open it up to questions at this point. How many uh, schools and child care centers have been tested since? I, th I think it's been five schools. Is that correct? Five schools and five school close districts. to 300. Is it districts or schools? Five schools were tested in the spring, um, but there are schools like the ones that participated in the pilot um, whose results essentially will count towards this test. Okay, so we had yeah 16 facilities before <coughs> five uh, five uh, before they shut down for the summer. Um, some of my frustration uh, was uh, why can't we test during the summer when we have time uh, to do this and. 
and I was told that we would get a false reading uh, because you need to have that f constant flushing in the, in the water working through the pipes. Um, so it would be uh, ineffective in some respects. So we had to make sure that the school uh, the schools were back open, uh, and that's why we'll we'll start again in September. So this is really just getting started. Very much in most so. Cases. But we're uh, we're at a point, uh, I believe, uh, it gave us an opportunity uh, to try this out, get the uh, uh, the the site all set up, uh, get the uh, department. Uh, ready to go, the health department ready to go. So I, I believe we'll be able to hit the ground running and uh, be able to take care of a number of these uh, in an uh, expeditious fashion uh, when we do start back up again. And the silver lining about you want to come up the summer. And the silver lining about the summer is we will have the majority of the child cares already done yeah. that are open year round. Uh, so that's a huge chunk of. Uh, lab results that will already be available on the website. And like in this example, when an action is taken, this, this fixture replacement, is there a round of retests to make sure that the action worked? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Any sample um, that is above standards where remediation is applied, other than permanently removing the fixture from service, it, it will be retested with both uh, the first flush and, and second draw samples to confirm that the, the action had the desired outcomes. Some of the schools that participated in that initial pilot, um, it, it, there was an iterative component to some of their work. So when it's the fixture, it's very clear oftentimes. You take that, that tap out of service and replace it, and you see instantaneous results. When it's deeper into the plumbing. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit more of an in investigative approach. Um, and so there, there are instances where it's an iterative process. So five schools, uh, around 300 child care centers so far. As you look at the results, um, are they better or worse than you expected? Ben Montrose from our drinking water program is probably best positioned to answer that. Yeah, yeah, come on up. Um, but going back to the 16 schools that we tested uh, initially, uh, it led us to, to believe that we're going to see uh, an issue be just because the large number within the, the sample of 16 in that pilot uh, program uh, that we'll probably see uh, more as we go along. And it's probably, I don't know if it's geographically or depending on, depending on the school and when it was built and constructed, um, that, that probably will have an effect as well, but please. So I'm going to bring up David Grass with me, who's my co-part um, with the health department. Um, we are seeing, certainly we've seen facilities and buildings that have had high results. We've seen a lot of the child care centers that have, a lot of times it's in home, so it's the kitchen tap. It's something that's probably a newer fixture. It's been used a lot. The results are quite low. So we've seen everything, you know, across the board. I think overall, um, I, I haven't been overly surprised by anything that we've seen, certainly. So, you know, it, it does depend, as the governor said, on the vintage of the plumbing and the pieces and parts. So it's really up to, excuse me, up to the tap by tap to see what, what's there. It's not, this school was entirely bad, it's that wing may have been high or those couple taps may have been high. I mean, would, would you say uh, of the taps that have been tested, 5% were above yeah. level? So, so uh, it's been consistent with what we saw in the pilot testing. So all five of the schools that tested in the spring had at least one tap that was elevated above the action level of four parts per billion. In terms of the child cares, uh, about 10% of the child cares that have tested already had at least one tap that was elevated above the action level. And again, that's about what we were expecting. And so what does it tell you if you have a facility where one tap tests fine and the, another tap in a different part of the building is over the limit? Does that help you identify what the cause is? It's it's a it's a fixture. Uh, keep in mind, you, you know, it's it's a faucet, uh, it's a water fountain, it's something uh, of that nature. So the fixture itself uh, could be suspect. It could be something within the fixture, uh, and that's why it needs to be replaced. Um, but if it was uh, throughout uh, the whole system, it might lead you to believe that there's something further in, in the piping uh, as at the inlet uh, of the, of the uh, school or, or wherever it is. But, but typically, I think uh, it's the fixture itself. Right. Yeah. After I've said it, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the, the, the lead content standards in the plumbing regulations have changed over time. So if it's an older fixture, it may have had 50-50 lead tin solder. Yeah, if this was up until the, the early 80s. If it's been installed since then, it's had less lead content. If it's been installed, installed since 2011 or so, it's been even less lead content. 
and the lead is in the solder, it's in the brass, it's in various pieces and parts. So if, if, if they've replaced the kitchen faucet in the last decade, should be fine. If it's an older fixture from the 60s or 70s, it may have higher lead solder. So it really is you know, case specific by each individual outlet. And who's paying for the remediation? Well, there is a, a program in place. There was money allocated for that. I think, uh, I believe it was a little over a million dollars, uh, but it's a sliding scale. There's some participation uh, that was re is required uh, depending on the, on the school and the size and so forth, I think. Uh, I don't know all the details of that, uh, but there is participation from the state, uh, and then we'll see. But, you know, we didn't know what the magnitude of this was or is uh, at this point. Um, so we'll learn more as we go along uh, if we find that uh, it exceeds uh, the amount of money that we, we have available. Uh, we'll obviously have to go back and ask for, for more uh, in the future to help with the remediation. But do you have more details you want to add on, on that? Sure. I can be very specific and down <laughs> in the weeds if you want. Um, <clears throat> so the state will pay for the costs, the actual costs, up to $1,800 for public drinking fountains and ice machines, $650 for outlets used for cooking, $350 for all other outlets in schools, $400 for all other outlets and child care providers. So does that cover most of the costs? For like one random faucet, that's very easy. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you think about just a, a faucet in your home, mm -hmm. it's, you know, under $100. Well, I was going to ask you about the homes, too. There's always been this concern about lead paint. Is there any, and now we're talking about fixtures and faucets, and homeowners aren't really aware of that, are they? Is this something that might be a concern in the future for residential properties? Huh? Or has the state ever done anything related to that? State's never educating. done it. I don't know of any state that's educating, actually done right. anything in that regard, but you're right. Um, whether you're talking about older faucets in the 60s and 70s that have not been replaced, or whether you're talking about housing that was constructed prior to the 80s uh, and painted uh, and not remediated, those paints most likely contain higher levels of lead than we'd like to see. So we always know about children who've themselves tested high for lead. And there's a program that assists uh, their parents and the homeowners, essentially, in investigating where the source of that lead could have come from and make sure that if it was paint, everybody's aware of it. Um, but not just in general, across uh, all homeowners. But would you also find the source of lead in, if it's in the pipes or in the faucets? The yeah, if, 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 oh. some, if some child actually tests positive, a complete uh, investigation is done. Okay. I'm gonna, uh, but you're right, education is critical. So uh, we've, we've done, a, I think, a, as good a job as we can as a state in educating the public about the dangers of lead and where it comes from. Um, uh, and most of the time, the focus has been heavily on the paint. Uh, but now I think everybody's much more aware of the water issue which we estimate may cause about 20% of the burden of lead in a child's body um, if they have a significantly high level. Mm -hmm. This is always dangerous, but I'm going to ask the question anyhow. Um, <laughs> can, can, uh, can homeowners uh, take their own samples and send them uh, to the Department of Health uh, for, to, for analysis? Yes. Yeah. So, um, the health department encourages all homeowners to test their test their water. We have a test your tap campaign, um, and that encourages homeowners to test every five years for uh, certain contaminants, uh, every three years for other contaminants, um, and and lead is one of them. And it could be that you are on town water, and the water coming into your home is great, uh, great quality, but the lead is getting introduced in your home, especially if you have those older fixtures. And so it's important to test. Unless you test, you don't know. Julie, this might sound like a strange way of asking this question, but I think it's an important one because you're both the head of a and but also a mom. And I wonder how moms out there should receive this information. When they hear that only a handful of schools have been tested, but each one found at least one tap to be a potential threat, uh, how do you hope they 
receive that info? I think uh, it's important to keep in mind some of the context that Dr. Levine provided, that lead in drinking water is but one source, and that lead paint is really the, the most dominant source in kids where we're seeing those high lead body burdens. That said, lead is, is invisible, right? It, you can't see it, you can't taste it. And so this sort of testing, as David just alluded to, is essential to understanding what's going on in our, our drinking water supplies. Um, and I would hope parents would have uh, be pleased to see the state undertaking a comprehensive initiative to make sure that we are doing our, our part um, to reduce exposure to kids to the extent possible in these places where they, they spend a lot of time. Um, I think the fact that the fixes are relatively low cost and straightforward should be reassuring to folks knowing that the, this work will be done, <clears throat> excuse me, and done quickly. I think it's also, don't go away, um, <laughs> I think it's also important to note uh, the, that the federal standard is much higher uh, than the Vermont standard is at this point. So this should give uh, Vermonters, uh, I, I guess, uh, some sense of security, knowing that uh, we're going to a different, uh, a much uh, stricter standard uh, for uh, for detecting this and, and highlighting this. So. Um, I think it's is it 15 parts per billion. Correct. Is yeah. is the federal standard, and ours is much lower. Right. Ours is anything that ex exceeds four, and it is in recognition of the point Dr. Levine made that there there's no safe level of lead exposure, and we know that some of our most sensitive and vulnerable populations are those that are in our child care facilities and schools. If a school uh, has found to have lead, is there a time frame they need to fix this by a month or? Yeah, it's uh, as I understand it, uh, it's shut down uh, immediately if there's a if there's a fixture that uh, exceeds the limit, we, the fixture is shut down uh, then. So they have to they have to either repair it or not use it. So it's immediate. Right, and we we haven't seen a, a systemic lead issue where an every um, outlet in an entire facility has been above our action level of four parts per billion. So generally, there are other faucets or taps that folks could go to in the interim while that work is being done. Um, but bottled water is also always an option if if we were to discover a systemic problem in a particular location. But they're required to fix it. They are required. They're, they're required to take it out of service immediately. Um, to the extent that they don't wish to return the fixture to service, you could imagine if you're a school and you had dozens of, of water fountains or bubblers, you may choose to, to um, leave one out of service rather than replace it. Um, but it can cannot be returned to service um, with with a fixture that's known to have high lead levels. Great. Other questions? <laughs> I have none. <laughs> uh, what is your reaction to court um, granting a preliminary injunction against Woodside uh, requiring some changes to policies about restraints and seclusion practices? Uh, what is your reaction to yeah, that? Yeah, obviously unfortunate. Uh, the incident itself is unfortunate. Um, we've been talking about Woodside uh, with the legislature, uh, legislative leaders uh, over the past session, uh, trying to come to some conclusion about what we want Woodside to be, either a rehabilitation center or a detention uh, facility or a combination. And we're still working our way through that and, and uh, working with the legislature to, to come to terms with that. But obviously, uh, we own this. Uh, we're going to do better. Uh, we. Uh, we thank the court for uh, for offering their advice and opinion, uh, and we'll adhere to that. Arguably, this had been sort of something that had been known for a while. There had been a lot of criticism um, about these practices before this ruling. Why wasn't something done before? Well, we we uh, believe that uh, something had been done uh, along the way, uh, but just not quick enough. And. Uh, Again, we own it, we need to do better, and uh, we'll move forward from this. When you say that, what are you referring to? Um, you mean what we've done yeah. in the past? I, I, the, the Department of Child, um, Children and Families and Corrections have been aware of this issue uh, and, uh, and have uh, taken action and rectified uh, some of the situation. Obviously, uh, this incident uh, that I haven't seen, uh, I've just read about, uh, is something that uh, uh, that we can't tolerate. Uh, we should do better. With all with the recent shootings around the country, do you have any second thoughts about vetoing the 
waiting period here in Vermont? No, well, the, the waiting period uh, legislation uh, was geared around uh, suicides. Uh, it wasn't really geared around uh, mass shootings of, of this nature. As you recall, we took a lot of action uh, a year ago uh, on this issue, and, uh, and it's proving to be uh, the right step to make, I believe. Um, many other states have followed suit. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, sometimes after the fact, when you look at uh, other states like uh, Florida and uh, Arizona and so forth, um, I think we, uh, we did what we, we thought was right, and, uh, and I'll stand by that. Uh, and this issue that, from my perspective, uh, the data didn't back up uh, what, the, what they were trying to accomplish. It was handguns only, 24-hour waiting period. Uh, and most of the deaths that, we've, uh, that I've seen, uh, data reflects uh, our people, uh, military, uh, which is concerning, uh, veterans. Uh, in an older age, so um, I'm not sure that this would have helped in that situation. Would you like to see Congress uh, go back and reinstate the uh, assault weapons ban? Well, I think Congress uh, should take a look and determine that themselves. I, I'd like to see them take action, and uh, it's like uh, whether it's immigration or, or gun safety uh, measures. Uh, I think we're just waiting for for Congress to do something, rather than just this partisan polarization. Divide that's uh, that's uh, that's we're witnessing uh, across our country. So, I think that they need to take action on something. But would you support a, an assault weapons ban? Well, you know, I had weighed in on this assault weapons ban uh, issue before. Um, you, you know, when you take a, a hunting rifle, a two twenty three hunting rifle, it's semi-automatic. It's not really a lot different than an assault weapon. It just looks different, and the magazine uh, capacity is different with an assault weapon. So. We, uh, rightly or wrongly, will find out. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, a Supreme Court case that will will uh, come to uh, to, to uh, terms with with the magazine limits, whether that's constitutional or not. But uh, the magazine limit uh, somewhat took care of that assault weapon issue. So when you say you want Congress to do something, well, what, yeah. What do you want them to do? Well, background checks. I mean. Red flag legislation. I mean, all kinds of things. I think that they should, they should take another look. Uh, once we, we have uh, uh, enhanced background checks, I think they really need to take a look at the NIC system itself, uh, because I think it needs improvement. And I think it has to reflect some of the red flag uh, legislation uh, that we've uh, we passed, and whether that's introduced in the NIC system, uh, and how quickly. I think this is this is all evolving uh, before before our eyes, and it's something that we have to come to grips with. So do you think the Vermont law that you signed uh, serves as a model for what should be done at the federal level? Well, I think it's being looked at. I mean, uh, the red flag legislation is being uh, talked about. Uh, the uh, enhanced uh, background checks are, are being talked about. So a lot of the, the measures we took are, are being considered, or at least talked about. I don't know about considered at this point, but at least talked about. What is your reaction to the insurance rates that were approved by the care board last year. Yeah, again, concerning. Um, it, the, these rate increases are affecting everyday Vermonters. And, uh, and I talk a lot about the affordability of our state. And when you see a 10, 11, 12 percent increase, it affects the, uh, the, the folks uh, that are in, are in need. Um, so uh, it, it, this, uh, the, we're, we're again, uh, I think there's many steps that need to be taken some long term. Um, hopefully uh, we're taking a look and seeing if there's some, some approach we could take uh, with reinsurance and so forth, but that's, that's, uh, that's something the Agency of Human Services is, is working with uh, the, our federal, uh, uh, federal folks uh, to see if there's anything we can accomplish in that area. But again, concerning and unsustainable. But the all-payer model uh, that we've uh, uh, we've been working on uh, that uh, had the pilot program, enhanced that. Um, we think it's part of the answer long term. Um, but we also need a younger, healthier population being introduced in Vermont. That's, I, I think that's part of our problem as well. As we age, we, we use health care more. Uh, it just uh, the usage goes up, the costs go up, and we don't have the younger, healthier population uh, that is uh, hel helping to spread the, the burden. I mean, when you look at the factors in the rate increases, you saw an older demographic, you saw prescription, prescription drugs, drugs right? yeah. So, I mean, you've got 
factors out there that, I mean, how do you deal with those? In, well, in yeah, again, prescription drugs, for instance. Uh, I forgot about that, but uh, we, uh, we, took, we took some steps as a legislature and the administration working together. I signed the legislation for uh, reimportation from Canada. Um, the federal government has, uh, has said, well, we're going to try and, you know, put something forward uh, to, to help uh, uh, the states uh, that uh, are interested in doing this, um, and we look forward to working with them. I've asked for, uh, I'm going to be asking uh, for a meeting uh, with, uh, with the fe our federal um, uh, human services uh, agency uh, to see where we go from here, because we want to be part of... Uh, whatever they put forward and we'd like to expedite it as, as, as fast as possible. So, yeah, prescription drugs is a major factor as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.